Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Ron Granary, professor of history in the Department of National Security and Strategy at the Army War College and podcast editor for the War Room. We're delighted you could join us for our conversation today. 75 years ago this month, Allied forces were advancing toward the German Reich. The end of the Second World War in Europe appeared within reach, and one of the most popular songs in the U.S. was Bing Crosby singing, I'll Be Home for Christmas. All of those hopes faded, however, when German troops launched a surprise counteroffensive through the Ardennes Forest. Combining tactical surprise with profligate use of their last armored reserves, Wehrmacht and SS units pushed deep into the Allied rear, aiming at the Channel Coast of Belgium. The resulting Battle of the Bulge began as an intelligence disaster, but ended as one of the greatest victories for the U.S. Army. By the time the Germans had been stopped and thrown back in late January, Allied and German casualties topped 150,000 killed, wounded, or missing. But the Wehrmacht was a spent force. The cost had been immense, but victory in Europe was now in sight. Our guest today to discuss the history and significance of the Battle of the Bulge is Dr. David W. Hogan, Jr., Director of Histories at the U.S. Army Center of Military History. A native of Michigan and a graduate of both Dartmouth College and Duke University, he is the author of A Command Post at War, First Army Headquarters in Europe, 1943 to 45, Centuries of Service, the U.S. Army, 1775 to 2005, and Raiders or Elite Infantry, the U.S. Army Rangers from Dieppe to Grenada. He is currently working on a biography of General of the Army Omar N. Bradley, and we are delighted to have him calling in today on A Better Peace. Welcome, Thrilled Dr. Hogan. Well, it's great to have Thrilled you. Thrilled to be here. So, um, Dave, what were the Germans trying to accomplish in the Ardennes counteroffensive? Well, I would say they were nothing less than trying to turn the war around in the fall of 44. Uh, the war had been going very badly ever since the summer of 1944 when the Allies had destroyed the German 7th Army at the Falaise Pocket. Uh, and in September 1944, uh, defeat looked not only likely, but imminent mm -hmm. for the German army. And it was at that point that uh, Adolf Hitler told his generals that he was going to launch an, a winter offensive that would turn the war around. Now, the, now the Germans, uh, German generals were not uh, just were very like, how do we have the resources for that? We don't, we don't have the resources, we don't have the divisions, we don't have the tanks, we don't have the fuel, we don't have all these things. And and they were thinking of something considerably less ambitious, mm -hmm. uh, maybe carving off a slice of the uh, of the Allied front, what the, what the Germans like to call the small solution. But Hitler was, uh, he was going for it all. He was a big believer in the importance of will and of intangibles in war, mm -hmm. and he thought he wanted a major scale counteroffensive, not just a little counterattack, but a major scale of a counteroffensive that would drive in between the Allied armies all the way to Antwerp mm -hmm. and at the, at the same time create rancor within the alliance. Hitler never thought that the, uh, that the British and the Americans and the Russians would be able to hold together that well. And um, by that, by that means, force the Allies into negotiating a peace with him. Well, and, and I'm, I am curious because we know how Hitler imagined the, the power of the force of will. But from a uh, historical perspective or even from a, an operational perspective at the time, how realistic was the prospect that even a successful German counteroffensive would have significantly changed the Allied strategic calculation by late 1944? Well, the Allied objective all along had been unconditional surrender, mm -hmm. and and Hitler was of course aware of that. Um, he, the alternative for the for the Reich, I think I think his generals had been holding out for some kind of negotiated peace. That mm -hmm. was the only alternative they saw for defeat. But um, Hitler had beaten the odds before, and he he felt um, that he could 
pull it off again. He had had generals telling him this couldn't be done quite quite often, fast, and uh, and there was just you know if, if all the breaks went right, there was just enough of a possibility that that just maybe this thing could could work out I at guess. least in his view. Well, and and the breaks do work out in the beginning. Um, so how were the Germans able? to achieve such a degree of surprise over the Allies? Well, it's the old story, I guess. You run into it with Pearl Harbor and everything. You can go back and you can look at this and that and the other thing and say, and uh, say, well, we should have foreseen it mm-hmm. on, the, on this basis and this basis. As Adolf Rosengarten, an intelligence officer in First Army, remarked, after the fact, even the fool is wise. <laughs> but, um, but, yes, uh, it's... Part of the part of the problem was that the, of course, the U.S. intelligence officers agreed with the German generals that they really didn't have the capability. That um, the 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 Germans were having to build uh, new divisions out of just out of just headquarters and fragments during the fall of 1944. Uh, the, the a lot of the Allies did not Allied intelligence officers of various echelons just did not think the Germans had this scale of the offensive that was possible in them. They were reading a lot of the same indications that German intelligence officers were. Mm-hmm. However, it's also true that several of these intelligence officers sensed something was up. I was just thinking about that. So there was there were indications the Germans were planning something, but would you say that the Allied uh, intelligence officers were simply because they didn't assume it would be a massive uh, attack, they just couldn't imagine that's what the Germans were planning to do? I think the the big problems were the scale and the location hmm. of the offensive. They were thinking more in terms of a counterattack as opposed to a larger counteroffensive. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what you run into is that intelligence officers, General Strong, Eisenhower's intelligence officer, uh, Gen- General General uh, Dixon at First Army, General Koch at Third Army, all all pinpointed that there were that there was this some kind of German buildup going on. All through the fall, there was concern about the location of the 6th Panzer Army. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, some of that coming from uh, from ultra-intercepts and and from various indications. The uh, German troops seemed to be in better spirits. Uh, there seemed to be some sense that uh, we're going we're gonna to strike back. Um, there, there were little indications along that, but when it really came down to the crunch of predicting the time and place, uh, I think uh, the only person who even came close was uh, Oscar Koch at Third Army, who uh, who sort of sensed there was a buildup going on in the Ardennes. But when you look at the others, like Monk Dixon, who uh, that that uh, Henry Fonda character in the Battle of the Bulge is roughly <laughs> modeled after, right? Um, he, you know, Monk Dixon to the end of his life uh, said that the that he had predicted. In fact, he even had a situation map of December 15th hanging in his living room when when uh, an American historian came to visit. But uh, the trouble with Dixon's estimate is that uh, he has a, predicted a counterattack at the Roar River. Ah. Up up and uh, you know up up toward Aachen. Right. You know, he's not thinking so much of the Ardennes. Mm. Now you can in retrospect you can look back, you can look at some of the intelligence indications, some local 28th Infantry Division officers interviewed a German woman who crossed the line and mentioned there were a lot of tanks going on and so on and so forth, and and uh, some talk among German troops in the area of an offensive as a Christmas present for the Führer. <laughs> but um, but they, they just they did. But there were a lot of things that were a problem. The Germans did a superb job of deception, just like the Allies had done at D-Day. The Germans kept uh, had radio silence. They did a great job with camouflage in a heavy, heavily wooded area. Um, they had there was some poor coordination among the G2 sections, animosity between the First Army and 12th Army Group, um, lack of civilian reports. They were moving into Germany now, so the civilian population wasn't as um, in favor of the Allies. Poor weather, which hurt the air reconnaissance, which was a big Right. A big factor. Um, yeah, it, it's uh, and also I think there was this uh, belief that von Rundstedt was in charge, the uh, the old Prussian who had mm-hmm. Hitler had named commander of Army Commander West, but instead of the cautious Rundstedt, you actually had Hitler calling the shots for this offense. Right. Well, you know, since you uh, since you broke the ice by mentioning the movie The Battle of the Bulge, I I wanted to ask you that one of the 
fictionalized characters in the film as the German commander Robert Shaw is uh, this image of such a great job. It's a, it's a, it is he he really did a very fine job in the film. But one of the ways that the story is presented is he is an experienced experienced commander who's given a lot of very green troops. Is that accurate? That the Germans, when they cobbled together these units, that they were using a lot of of younger. Uh, younger, inexperienced troops, or is that just for dramatic effect in the film? That is that is true. Mm-hmm. Now, now as with so many of the characters in that movie, Shaw's character, Colonel Hessler, mm-hmm. is kind of a composite. Right. But um, you know, I, I, he's most closely he resembles uh, Pfeiffer, mm-hmm. Piper in the uh, comp group Piper. Mm-hmm. But uh, but it is true. Many of these German formations, especially these Volksgrenadier divisions, divisions that have been smashed and France during the summer. Uh, they got back to Germany. They were trying to fill it with uh, with uh, younger conscripts, older men. Uh, with there, there were a lot of green troops in the Wehrmacht at this point. They were they were scraping the barrel at mm-hmm. the, and so yes, yes, there is some. Um, there is certainly a considerable amount of truth to that. Well, and if, as you say, right, one of the reasons why the Allies perhaps wouldn't have been ready is because they weren't expecting a commander to be as irresponsible, let's say, and as uh, profligate with the use of his resources as Hitler turned out to be. Um, should we look at the Allied victory in the Battle of the Bulge as just the, uh, the a, a sort of uh, inevitable result of the fact that once the Allies regained their balance, they were going to be able to push the Germans back. Well, there's a reason why the Ardennes was not viewed as a prime area for a <laughs> counterattack. Right. And, and the Germans found that out in the course of the counterattack. When they, um, when they were assaulting against the northern shoulder, mm-hmm. uh, the 6th Panzer Army, which was the main focus of the attack, they were attacking a series of ridges mm-hmm. and uh, heavily wooded country, which was not ideal for armor. So you put those things together in the state of the German army, which we've remarked on, and uh, yeah, it's it was it was a long shot all the way. Mm-hmm. But that, but it's also it's very true that the um, and the, it also it's very true that the Americans just uh, did it. The American defense at the lower levels was was uh, very very stubborn, right. particularly. Particularly when you figure the first the first day, really the high command and on the Allies, the American side, it's basically an American battle. Mm-hmm. The high command on the American side was very slow to react because they were slow to get a picture. On um, the first day of the attack, uh, the particularly in the northern shoulder, they pretty much stopped Six Panzer Army along most of the front, hmm. and uh, but and it was hard for uh, peop- for hard for commanders like Courtney Hodges of 1st Army, to gauge what was really going on because the Germans were playing radio phonograph records over over radio waves, and, they, and artillery fire knocked out a lot of the wires right. behind. So it was very hard for, uh, and indeed for much of the early days of 1st Army, for uh, them to get a real clear picture of what was going on. But in the meantime, the American, American troops, infantry, engineers, stood and fought, Particularly, I've mentioned the American artillery, as it was throughout the war, was just absolutely superb. Mm-hmm. You get all these accounts of uh, German attacks. Uh, they didn't always have the most inspired tactics, making frontal attacks with infantry. But when they did, and even when they used armor, they ran into a rain of artillery shells, very precisely targeted. And and that um, that did in an awful lot of uh, the German attacks. Um, American engineers were very skilled at uh, the, the Ardennes roads were not real good and and the American engineers were very effective at mining tree cutting trees hampering routes that the Germans would need um, the Americans were once they figured out what was going on were very quick to respond a lot of mobility and flexibility and troop movement staff sections did themselves very well um, and they were able to hold the key road junctions like uh, the Mancho, Shao Shoulder, Saint Vith, and Bastogne. And Bastogne. Of course, everyone here at the War College wants to make reference to our one of our distinguished graduates, General McAuliffe, and the 101st. Oh, yes. Um, mm-hmm. That uh, the the idea that the that sustaining sort of uh, accepting the blow from the Germans and being able to stand fast to to show that kind of resilience, right? This is something that has to happen at this mid to lower levels, right? The, this is correct. Yeah, and and so is this 
is this a reflection of a particular kind of training that uh, uh, American soldiers re- received before the war? Or is, this, uh, is, is there something deeper to look for here for that kind of resilience in the typical U.S. soldier? Well, it's, um, that's, that's an interesting question. And uh, I do know that by this time you had a lot of divisions that were very highly regarded. Some of the early divisions that went into action early in the war, uh, General George C. Marshall did not feel were as, as well developed as the, sec- the next wave mm-hmm. of, uh, for example, the 1st Armored Division in North Africa had a hard time right. because of lack of training in Britain and assorted other places, whereas some of these later divisions that came in, the American Army had a very well-developed uh, lessons-learned capacity. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were they were better trained, better prepared in that sense. Um, it is true you do have some green divisions. The 106th Division never did have much of a chance. Uh, the Germans broke through the Losheim Gap, which was guarded by only a mere cavalry group. Mm-hmm. Um, the Panzer columns came through there, and they were able to isolate the 106th Division on the Schnee Eiffel, two regiments, without a whole lot of trouble. But you had, other, you had others there. The 28th Division, which was a veteran division, fought very hard. The 4th Infantry Division was a, better, was a veteran division. And those were both divisions that had, had um, I mean, they were worn out from the heavy fighting in the Hurricane Forest above, but somehow they found the resources within them to, to delay the Germans just enough for the so to speak, the uh, cavalry to ride. Right, so to speak. Well, and I would say that one of the one of the recurring themes in studying the Second World War is that uh, Hitler had a uh, had a great many prejudices, to put it mildly. But one of them was his belief that somehow uh, Americans were soft and weak, uh, and the democratic society wouldn't stand up to the challenge of war. Um, and the Battle of the Bulge is a good indication that uh, American soldiers proved very much capable of responding well, to a threat. It was a concern among American mm. officers before the war too. Fair that point. Could we could we make uh, could we make combat troops out of these folks? Mm. And even throughout the course of the war, Americans American officer commanders expressed concern that their troops didn't really hate the Germans enough. <laughs> that they were that there was a sort of an apathy about it, but. But when their when their backs were up against the wall, the American the American troops did fight very well, and and the combined arms effect. I mean, they were a little slow to get the air power because of the weather because of the problems. Weather, right. um, but uh, but artillery and uh, and and the tanks in the uh, tanks and tank destroyers. We hear a lot about how the American tanks were inferior in head to head combat against the German tanks, but the Americans had devised. Uh, had devised various tactics to make up for that, and uh, and and so technology is one thing, and then then there is the issue of command and command decisions. And there, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, people might already have certain sort of sense of historically about who are the uh, who are the heroes of the Battle of the Bulge, uh, but in general within the Allied armies, whose stock among the commanders uh, rose as a result of their performance in the Battle of the Bulge, and whose fell <laughs> well what i think the first person who comes out the best <laughs> at the end is dwight d eisenhower that's yeah, always good to start at the top that's right yep start at the top he um he reacted very quickly to this to this uh, like when when word started coming in on the first day you know there's something going on up there he largely intuitively sensed this is not just a mere a mere uh, counterpunch, mm-hmm. you know, that that's maybe something bigger. And he was very quick to commit his reserves, the 7th Armored Division on the northern shoulder and the 10th Armored Division on the southern shoulder. Right. He was also quick to send in the 18th Airborne Corps, the uh, 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions. Mm-hmm. Um, he didn't have a whole lot of reserve. We only had 90-some divisions in the whole Army for the war. But, uh, but he was, the reserves he did have, he was perceptive enough to see right away and he also exercised a, a very positive moral effect at the mm-hmm. verdun conference in december 19th he made clear that you know there are no long faces at this table we are going to see this as an opportunity um in an environment when um when a lot of certainly civilians in the area oh no here come the germans again mm-hmm. uh he was he was very uh re- 
presented a very reassuring atmosphere in the Allied command. So I think Eisenhower ranks big. Of course, another one who ranks big is Patton, right? Who was uh, conducting an offensive at the time of the at the time of the Ardennes offensive, but perhaps because he was somewhat tipped off by Colonel Koch, his G two, mm-hmm. um, was uh, had had some contingency plans ready. And there were some divisions out of line that when the word came that we have to we have to turn north to meet this thrust, uh, Patton was very adept, and within a couple of days he was able to get his his army turned, a couple of corps turned around to launch an attack on the flank of the German of the German salient. And so we have indications uh, that so Patton was aware of this possibility. So there was some preparation. It wasn't simply a uh, he didn't just he turn not, on a dime. Well. I don't know if any. Well, let, let me get into that. <laughs> Pat and I, Pat and I think was um, he had some sense, uh-huh. you know, like Pat, like Eisenhower. I think he was he was a little more intuitive in his style. In fact, uh, he probably had a better sense for the battlefield than any other American commander. Mm-hmm. Um, I would hesitate to say that he predicted the attack. Right. That he or Koch really predicted the attack, but they but they were. Not unprepared for it. Gotcha. They were able to. They were able to make some. Ch- they were able to show their flexibility and mobility, a sense. And Patton, of course, um, being a, being the driver he was, made sure that none of these obstacles would interfere with the thrust from the south. Now, um, of course, I have to mention that thir- I have three candidates for each of these. <laughs> um, the third candidate would be the American soldier in general, and we've already talked some Indeed. about about how the American soldier. At a time when most of his high command didn't really know that well what was going on, was giving his life and doing whatever necessary to uh, to hold up the German thrust. Right. Now, uh, for figures who were who who lost from the bulge, obviously American intelligence was a big one. Right. I think no one was more identified in that sense than uh, General Edward Seibert of the Twelfth Army Group, who. Unfortunately, chose this particular moment just before the battle to to uh, set out a, a buttressed uh, intelligence estimate on how down the Germans were and how incapable they were counterattack. I don't know if Seibert himself was as uh, optimistic as that, but certainly the tone that was coming out of 12th Army Group was there was nothing to worry about. His commander, uh, Omar Bradley, does not come off well at the Battle of the Bulge in really? general. I, I think that uh, Bradley, you give Bradley marks for not getting flustered. Mm-hmm. I think that was true. But if anything, he he played that theme too too hard. Um, he was slow to react. Eisenhower had to tell him to do a lot of these various, you know, send send the tenth armored, send the seventh armored. Uh, Bradley was very suspicious that it was just a, a spoiling attack to throw off the offensive he already had underway. Hmm. And um, and one of the most controversial aspects of the bulge for him was that he did not uh, he did not move back his headquarters from Luxembourg. Again, he was probably responding to um, fears among the civilian populace uh, of the sense that the American army was giving up ground, and and he he was big he was big on appearances, but it led to his later loss of command of the northern shoulder. Mm-hmm. Because and because he biggest, was in no position to commit to reach the northern he, shoulder from where he was. He was right? No, he wasn't, mm-hmm. and the and the and that was important because of the third person who lost heavily from the bulge, uh, Courtney Hodges, the oh. first army commander. Um, his first army took the took the brunt of the German counteroffensive, and you know he was really the first American commander over the course of the war to to, to receive a German counteroffensive of that scale. Mm-hmm. It was not pleasant. There are indications that uh, Hodges was not in the best of health to begin with, and something happened on the 17th, whether lack of sleep or a bad cold or flu or whatever it was, but he was practically out of commission. Hmm. And, um, and in effect, Colonel uh, General William Keene, his chief of staff, did most of the work in terms of setting up the northern shoulder. Um, Hodges... Later, you know, he was forced out of his headquarters at Spa, back to Chaudfontaine, and then, then to Congress. Two movements that were rather hectic. Uh, one point, when Montgomery shows up, he, he feels Hodges needs to be relieved. He looked like he had been poleaxed, hmm. and he questions Eisenhower about that. And Eisenhower said, "Well, 
Hodges just looks uh, kind of down in the mouth, and that's just his. And uh, he'll fight well unless he's exhausted. So Hodges just manages to keep his command by the skin of his teeth. And does Hodges get a chance to uh, redeem himself later on in the campaign, or is that the end? Indeed. Of, yeah. Yes, he's he's um, he um, he proceeds with the with the bridge at Remagen, mm-hmm. which we've all heard about, and Indeed. he reacts well to that. Um, it's. It's a little hard hard to uh, make up for him too much in the sense that after the bulge, the German army was kind of going downhill. <laughs> right. But um, but yeah, he it's it's diffi- it's difficult for for him uh, now. Interestingly, a figure that we could kind of put in the middle of this up down uh, scenario is, is uh, Field Marshal Montgomery. I was going to ask what you thought about Montgomery and the and the British role since this is largely an an American battle, but Montgomery is there and yep. commanding the North. I think Montgomery comes off well in certain areas. Mm-hmm. He, of course, was very pleased that it seemed that his uh, his argument that we had been giving the haven't been pressing the Germans enough mm-hmm. uh, had been had been proved correct that they had managed to seize the initiative from us when when we should have all along been following his his uh, single thrust strategy in the north. So there was a more of a bit of self-satisfaction and self-justification in Montgomery's behavior. It's a chance to change the subject from Market Garden. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, um, yeah, but he had, he had been on this single ground command, single thrust, mm-hmm. uh, prioritize your prioritize your offensives for quite some time, and uh, and there was something about Montgomery. He was a very capable general in a lot of ways, but. Somehow, personality-wise, he just had to rub the American's nose in it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And even when he tried to express confidence in the American soldier in his ill-fated early January press conference, where which one British officer described it as, what a good boy I am, <laughs> uh, he, he, um, he, ma- he managed to come off as condescending, uh-huh. which, which infuriated Bradley. Right. And, uh, that, and that was kind of the end of relations between them for a large part. But Montgomery did some good things. When he was put in command of the northern shoulder, he was, uh, he was very, he was, he came down to, he gave First Army a presence at First Army headquarters that uh, Bradley had not. Mm-hmm. And um, he, he, he pretty much, he, he straightened out the front in certain in various ways, not always in accordance with what the Americans thought, according to their doctrine, they should be doing. Mm-hmm. But um, but he, he did give a, a kind of a firm hand at the time when one from above was somewhat lacking. Well, and, and that, that counts for something in a crisis. So we're just about out of time, but so I, I, I want to give you a chance to to wrap this up by talking about the larger uh, significance of the Battle of the Bulge. What was its impact on subsequent Allied strategy in the West and on the overall strategic situation in Europe at that time? Well... I guess you could say, first off, it was the beginning of the end for the Germans. Right. Uh, Bradley had been complaining all fall that it was just hard to get the Germans out into the open, where where he could attack, where he could make the most gains against them. Sure. Now, after, now when Beetle Smith reminded him of that after the counterattack, Bradley said, "I'll be damned if I wanted one this big <laughs> to get them out of the." But but it is true the Germans lost heavily in men, supplies, equipment, morale, all those things. Um, it it really was, in a sense, their last gasp in a kind of, but a grand last gasp in a kind of a Wagnerian opera sort of way. I have I have read in in the German literature that the speculation is that one of the reasons why Hitler decided on this uh, counteroffensive in the West is he was he wanted to make sure that there uh, that there would not be surrenders in the West. That he wanted right. to, uh, that, that he was aware of the fact that the the German armies in the West were willing to surrender to the Americans and the British, and he wanted to drag the war out as long as possible. Well, I guess the way you have to kind of remember this is this is central in not Nazi ideology, mm-hmm. the stab in the back, right? And when you from World War One, and when you put that together with um, the importance of the will. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, with the will, if you have the willpower, you can do just about anything. And uh, the Germans had lost World War One because they just hadn't had the will. Mm-hmm. And that was bas- that was basically Hitler's attitude again in World War Two. If the Germans turned out to not have the will to, to stay with it, that uh, to, to support for him, then they, they would deserve what they would get. 
And um, and 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 for the U.S. Army, the bulge is really a catharsis too. Mm-hmm. They finally face a full-scale counteroffensive. You know, the Katsarine Pass, Mortain, all these different, all these different. You know, they were counterattacks, right? More like they they were, there was nothing on the scale of full-blown German counteroffensive, like the like the Allies had faced in 1940, for right. example, or the, that the Soviets faced. Right. So this but is because the- of the. Mm-hmm. I was just going to say, so this is their, this was their chance to, to stand up against the worst that the Germans could dish out, and they stood yeah. fast and responded. That's right. Well, the worst in 1944. At anyway. least the 1944, anyway. That's right. Yeah, it does help it, I mean, sense. it was for the for the Americans in the end. You know, it was scary, but in the end, it was not all that dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the the Germans really did not come close to Antwerp. Mm-hmm. Um, they really weren't even that close to the Meuse, although they were close Meuse River, although they were close enough that Montgomery had some British formations backstopping along there right. just in case. But um but it was but I don't wanna the Amer- it really was an American battle. Montgomery exercised some influence over mm-hmm. it, but um but even when he was somewhat kind of backhandedly trying to claim credit, Churchill stepped in and said this is the greatest American battle of the war, and go. will, I believe, be regarded as an ever-famous American victory. Well, he told that to Parliament, when, and that kind of settled the controversy that was building. Well, and I, frankly, that controversy was about as close as Hitler got to creating the rancor. <laughs> well, and, and it's, good, it's good in a situation like this to let Winston Churchill have the last word. Dave Hogan, thank you so much. This has been a, a very illuminating conversation. We really do appreciate you joining us here on A Better Peace. Pleasure being here. Thanks to all of you for listening in. Uh, We look forward to hearing your comments, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Until next time, for Better Peace, uh, for The War Room, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.